Great. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, th there's an interactive portion to this that will go through the second half. So if you want to scan that uh, now, great. It'll be up uh, later as well. Um, so I have to admit, I, I uh, delayed very long in, in defining uh, my title uh, for this talk. Um, because uh, my lab for the last 15 years has really had an emphasis on open data and knowledge graphs, and uh, that's been our core expertise. Uh, but obviously, large language models have, have uh, been very disruptive in the best possible way over the last uh, 18 months, and to not comment on sort of how that's influenced our direction, I think, would have been uh, incredibly uh, short-sighted. So uh, here we are uh, with uh, this title. Um, but I wanted, do want to start by telling you about some of the um, uh, three vignettes about our work in open data and knowledge graphs. Um, and the first one is, is the GeneWiki project. So we initiated this back in 2007, and uh, the mission statement at the time was to create a Wikipedia article for every human gene. And uh, one of our thought processes was that well, we could take a lot of the structured data in the biomedical databases we all know and love, we can systematically create Wikipedia articles, and then we could use the crowdsourcing dynamics of Wikipedia that those uh, uh, Wikipedia articles would continually uh, evolve and grow and expand. And um, based on the evolution of those uh, Wikipedia articles, there were now 10,000 plus of them uh, that get viewed millions of times a month uh, collectively and uh, edited thousands of times a month. Um, we were able to do, you know, demonstrate a few different applications from uh, text mining out of the contributed uh, text to look for new biological annotations. Uh, we did a pilot project with um, a journal to look at a dual publication model where we have a peer review publication plus the live living article in Wikipedia. And we also experimented with directly embedding structured data in this unstructured resource uh, that is Wikipedia. Uh, and so, again, this project started in 2007. In 2013, 2012, 2013, we did a pretty hard pivot. Um, and that was when Wikidata came online. And Wikidata, for those who aren't familiar, is the structured data equivalent uh, to Wikipedia. So what Wikipedia is to text, Wikidata is to structured data. And so it employs all the same crowdsourcing dynamics, um, but yeah, just to developing a, a knowledge uh, base. And so the, the, the mission statement there changed to building a community knowledge graph for the life sciences. Uh, we, we switched our data um, processing pipeline to go not against Wikipedia, but against Wikidata. Wiki, uh, Wikipedia then, of course, could draw from Wikidata, which was nice. And then again, uh, Wikidata employs the same crowd and community editing dynamics. And from there, we had a, a number of vignettes that, um, that demonstrated the value of this integrated knowledge graph in things like drug repurposing, community curation, and uh, phenotype-based disease diagnosis. So uh, the resulting knowledge graph um, looks something like this, and I'll try to uh, give you a, a very quick sort of tour of it, but essentially every one of these, this is like a, a, a class diagram, I guess. So we have 17,000 diseases, and those uh, diseases can be related to, for example, genes, and you know, there's a million genes from many different taxa, and there are about 13,000 associations that join diseases to genes. Uh, diseases can also be linked to chemical compounds, uh, and chemical compounds have relationships to those based on uh, their ability to be used uh, to treat, and so on and so forth, right? The other type of entities here, we have sequence variants, anatomical structures, uh, proteins, binding sites, uh, so on and so forth. And so uh, the hope was that this would be a, um, a uh, knowledge graph that, uh, again, would be community maintained and, and continually updated. So for those who wanted to learn more about the GeneWiki project, there's another QR code there. So that's the first vignette I, I wanted to tell you about. The second vignette um, is taking what we learned about crowdsourcing within the scientific community, right? The GeneWiki project was very much focused on other scientists. Uh, and we wanted to expand that to crowdsourcing in a different community, uh, the, the, the community of the general public. And this follows on uh, the, the, the long tradition uh, and the, some great examples of, of so-called citizen science. 
um, and uh, many examples, past examples, of, of leveraging the collective efforts of, of non-scientists to, to really push science forward. Uh, in contrast to past efforts around citizen science, most past efforts really focused on leveraging the crowd's visual abilities, right? To do pattern recognition, um, 3D mod, uh, reasoning, things like that. And Mark to Cure, uh, which is our citizen, citizen science project, really uh, attempted to look at leveraging um, people's language processing skills to do tasks in information retrieval, uh, both named entity recognition and relationship extraction. Um, and, and we did a number of sort of proof of concepts to show that while individual uh, lay contributors are not as uh, skilled, obviously, as a trained bio curator, that in aggregate, um, they can reach uh, comparable levels of, of accuracy. And so we applied this uh, to uh, a particular rare disease, focusing on a rare disease community around NGLI1 deficiency. Um, through this work, we were able to engage over a thousand contributors, process a number of documents related to uh, thousands of documents relevant to this particular rare disease, come up with this um, knowledge graph that, that I think um, was, was helpful to, to researchers in that field. And along the way, we had some fun interactions, in-person interactions with uh, some fantastic crews of, of citizen science contributors. So if you wanna learn more, there's another QR code there. Again, these are just meant as little vignettes. And the third vignette I just wanna tell you about is, is sort of our more, most recent and, and ongoing work uh, related to BioThings Explorer. And, and BioThings Explorer is all about building a federated knowledge graph uh, through API interoperability. And the way this works essentially is that if you have a user that comes in with a query, for example, give me all genes associated with colon cancer, um, that query gets expressed in a structured format to BioThings Explorer. And BioThings Explorer consults uh, the Smart API registry. Uh, and Smart API is a registry of API metadata. And um, there are really three things that Smart API, a Smart API um, a registry record uh, contains. Um, it first describes the types of relationships that are in the API. Uh, it describes um, the method of calling the API and it describes a method of um, parsing the output for uh, given relationships. And so um, based on the, the, the desire to find relationships between genes and diseases, Smart API would tell you, okay, great, there are a handful of APIs. And Smart API would again tell you how to call them, how to parse the output, and that would be passed back to the user. Um, we built this system specifically to, to allow essentially chaining. So if you wanted to then look at, uh, take those genes and then find all drugs related to those genes, for example, then again, you could do the same thing again, now pass the genes in the query to the BioThings Explorer. Smart API would tell you which different APIs would be, have relevant information. And again, you retrieve them back like this. And so in this way, we, we have this federated knowledge graph. So the power of this really rests behind um, uh, all the great data that is in uh, the Smart API registry. Um, and so just to describe that in slightly more detail, this is what we think of it as a, a meta-knowledge graph, uh, sort of the most common relationships uh, in our, among the APIs in the Smart API registry. In total, there's about 58 APIs that can be, uh, have sufficient semantically precise metadata to be able to be called um, uh, by BioThings Explorer. And for example, there's 13 different APIs that give us information on the relationship between genes and diseases, eight APIs that give us information about small molecules and genes and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, and uh, if you want to learn more, uh, my colleague uh, Jackson Callahan uh, gave a fantastic talk last year and uh, the link to their talk is um, there uh, at, at Bosque um, in Lyon. Okay, so, so I've, I've given you three little vignettes about how our lab thinks about uh, open data and knowledge graphs. And, and really, I put this into a uh, broader ecosystem of uh, structured data resources. Um, and collectively, right, these resources really form the, the, the foundation for biomedical open data, right, and many other resources that aren't shown here. And, um, and, and I think uh, the value of open structured knowledge, right, is that 
those types of resources are very amenable to building computational tools to operate on those data that produce analyses and visualizations. And so a lot of work that we and many people uh, here and in the biocreation community think about, you know, how do we convert the vast stores of unstructured biomedical information into these uh, open uh, structured knowledge? And, and just to allude, right, I mean, these, these knowledge bases have, have value in their own right. Um, so some of the things we're doing uh, right now, we're looking at various um, graph reasoning algorithms to try to do link prediction and, and, and um, for, for example, drug repositioning. Um, and so, so they are, uh, these knowledge graphs are, are uh, yeah, great substrate for a lot of these analyses. But uh, more broadly, right, we also think about these, these tools because um, they are our window to the vast broader community of non-computational scientists, where non-computational scientists can use uh, or ask questions on these tools and, and use the, those results to get um, to generate hypotheses. And this is where I think large language models really sort of uh, uh, came onto the scene, right? Because Large language models, to some extent, um, skip the open, the structured part, right? And they operate on the vast uh, store of unstructured biomedical information here, right? And of course, they don't have access to just the biomedical information. Um, they're interested in expanding um, to all of the unstructured content that uh, is in the common crawl and, and things like that, right? And so, um, so. Um, obviously, ChatGPT was, was the first large language model with uh, this generally accessible uh, chat interface, um, and it showed a lot of promise. Um, I think we can all agree that the first versions had some rough edges. Um, I, I think, uh, frankly speaking, my first ChatGPT query was, was pretty disappointing. Um, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I think we could we could see uh, the value of this when we start thinking about uh, biomedical applications as well, or biomedical queries. Things like, you know, give me the clinical phenotypes associated with NGLI1 deficiency, and you get a really nice textual summary that incorporates a lot uh, of what was known. Uh, what are drug candidates in clinical trials related to Crohn's disease? Again, uh, really power, I think we all saw the power of, um, uh, of this sort of text-based uh, output. Um, on top of that, very quickly, we also saw uh, LLMs doing things we traditionally thought of as tooling and analyses on structured data. So for example, there were really a couple of really nice demonstrations about using LLMs for functional analysis of gene sets. So Marcin will actually give the talk uh, right after to describing one of these methods. Um, uh, this is the one on the left. Uh, and this one, I believe, was presented elsewhere at uh, ISMB uh, yesterday. So um, really great work that, again, shows how LLMs can be leveraged to, to, take, um, to take the role of some of these biomedical analyses. We also see in the examples of using LLMs to do cell type annotation from uh, single cell RNA-seq data, right? And relative to uh, commonly used tools for this job, right? Um, these large language models actually do um, pretty well. So um, I, I admit, I, I didn't grow up in the natural language processing field, and, and I'm sort of at the, the outskirts of, of, of um, AI. And, and so there was a moment where, you know, uh, a little bit of moment of panic, right? Um, have LLMs obviated the need to get our unstructured biomedical data into structured knowledge, right? And um, and, and I think we all, you know, quickly realized that that wasn't the case, right? Um, the, the, the Achilles heel of these LLMs, of course, is this issue of hallucinations or probably more accurately called confabulations. But, um, you know, so here's just one example, right? If you asked uh, GPT, uh, chat GPT, what, what is the genetic cause of Smith-Kingsmore syndrome? Um, you'll get very confidently back that it's a rare genetic disorder that's caused by mutation in the AS ASXL3 gene. And uh, that is despite, you know, very simple and very um, well curated knowledge that shows that in fact, Smith-Kingsmore syndrome is uh, caused by mutation in the mTOR gene, right? 
uh, if you asked uh, uh, ChatGPT to show me papers that describe the relationship between ASXL3 and smith kinsmore syndrome, it would very confidently give you uh, articles back that, um, that it believes uh, substantiates that link. Uh, the first one is a real article, but it actually has nothing to do with smith kinsmore syndrome. And the second article is a completely made up article itself, right? So these are the Achilles heels uh, of, of these large language models. And, um, and these confabulations don't exist in, chat, in GPT-4. Uh, and in general, GPT-4, we found, has been much, much better in terms of uh, these, uh, reducing these confabulations. But there's still a general principle here. And, and I think it was, it was best summarized uh, in this quote. You can machine learn Obama's birthplace every time you need it, but it costs a lot and you're never sure it is correct. Um, and this is from uh, Jamie Taylor, uh, who runs the Google Knowledge Graph. And so, um, so then it comes back to this model where I think we've all, uh, or many of us in, in the field have really converged on is that there is actually a good synergy to be had between the large language models and open structured data. And if we leverage that appropriately, then I think we can uh, really have um, really powerful resources. Um, I wanna highlight a few, um, a few bits of work um, that others have done that have really inspired us in terms of our work in this area. And, and I think you know, we start back with sort of this idea of retrieval augmented generation, so RAG. So just for um, the, the few people who perhaps aren't familiar with this, right, RAG was, was developed as a way specifically to address this uh, idea of hallucination. And I found that this RAG, which I'll describe in, a, in just slightly more detail in a second, that, it's, um, that results are more strongly grounded in real factual knowledge. And uh, these uh, RAG models, or, or this RAG approach, makes it hallucinate uh, less. So um, how does RAG work, right? So um, instead of where the user goes directly to the LLM, right, uh, the, the, it's intercepted here, where uh, given some sort of question or some sort of prompt, um, you'll, you can go out into some sort of external document store to get additional information relevant to that query. And that is provided in the prompt context, right? So this is so-called in-context learning. And that essentially makes the LLM better. So for example, suppose somebody wanted to make the query summarize the genetic basis of colon cancer, right? That's this original prompt. Through a RAG model, right? We take that prompt and you might search, you know, colon cancer or colon cancer genetics in sort of external sources. It could be it could be PubMed, whatever. You extract snippets like these, and this then together is all the context that goes to the LLM, right? So you're directly interjecting uh, additional information into the prompt, and that obviously greatly improves uh, the results of um, the LLM. Not only does it re reduce the tendency to confabulate, it also provides the LLM more current knowledge that wasn't may not have been available uh, at the time the LLM was trained. So there's all sorts of reasons why RAG is, is important. And um, we saw taking that general principle of RAG and applying that to Knowledge Graph, this is a, a, a really uh, our first sort of entry point into how we could see these things working together. And this was done by Karthik Soman and uh, Sergio uh, Baranzini. And um, where instead of going against document stores over here, right, we, they consulted their uh, internal knowledge graph. This was the spoke knowledge graph that um, uh, has a heterogeneous graph with all sorts of information. And they really showed how, again, by intercepting this prompt, uh, adding context from their knowledge graph and putting it uh, that in the LLM drastically improved their results. Um, I, I've sort of simplified their results table, but they looked at two different benchmarks uh, on the left uh, without uh, the KG rag on the right with the KG rag. And you can see in both cases, you see um, um, significant improvements in the performance uh, on these two benchmarks for uh, these three LLMs tested. Um, so in addition to this, this principle of rag where, where you know, we add things into the prompt itself, right? we've also been really motivated by a couple examples of doing tool augmentation. 
right? And so tool augmentation is a little bit di different in the sense that now we actually teach the LLM to go out and consult external resources. Um, so Jiang Lu uh, gave a, a nice talk earlier at ISMB. Um, and one of the tools that his lab has developed is, is Gene GPT, where, uh, so Jiang is at uh, the National Library of Medicine. And uh, so it's very close to these APIs that the NCBI provides. And so uh, through clever instructions to the LLM, you can teach, they taught the LLM to actually access uh, many of the APIs that the uh, NCBI provides. Um, these are the, the six uh, sort of API endpoints that they uh, taught uh, GPT to uh, actually use. Uh, so eUtils for, for, um, for those who are familiar, right? There's eUtils to get information on genes and SNPs. There's BLAST to do uh, uh, sequence alignments, uh, various APIs for aliases and SNPs and so on and so forth. And, um, and, and they showed that Again, using this idea of tool augmentation, um, they were able to show significantly improved results. So um, uh, out over here are the reference um, LLMs without any sort of tool augmentation. Every row is a benchmark here. And you'll just see that the bolds, bolded entries and the underlined entries are the, the top ranked uh, performance and those clustered around uh, these two columns, which uh, have this ability to um, query the NCBI uh, APIs. Uh, this approach for tool augmentation was, was, was followed very closely um, by another a great example of this uh, from the Monarch Initiative. Uh, Monarch is a, a, a great set of APIs really focused around uh, model organisms and, and anatomy and, and, and diseases and so forth. And they built this uh, phenomics assistant. And again, similarly uh, speaking, they, they essentially uh, instructed um, the LLM on how to uh, access these seven monarch endpoints um, and then uh, showed that, again, um, with uh, access to the monarch API uh, was showed significant improvement over the results without the Monarch API for these two uh, benchmarks. So this, of course, is, is, has inspired us uh, quite a bit uh, to think about how we can use our BioThings Explorer ecosystem uh, also as a, um, as a ecosystem of tools that can improve um, uh, LLM responses. Uh, and again, just to remind you, right, that, that we have these 58 or so um, APIs that are currently accessible to BioThings Explorer. And the nice part about leveraging sort of community re repositories for uh, uh, these community registries of API metadata, right, uh, once these updated, once new APIs are created, once their existing APIs are annotated by members of the community, right, in principle, those are immediately available um, for uh, tool augmentation as well. Okay, so, so this is sort of how we're, we see um, uh, our work tying into uh, LLMs um, and, and, um, um, and, and I wanna just briefly though comment a little bit about the, the benchmarks, which I a little bit glossed over in the examples uh, before. Um, but I, I just want to show a few examples of the benchmarks that, that, that are commonly used in terms of, of doing these assessments. So this is the BioAsk QA benchmark, and there's a series of yes-no questions uh, that relates to, you know, for example, do CPG islands co-localize with transcriptional start sites? Uh, factoid questions, which virus is best known to cause uh, infectious mononucleosis, so on and so forth, uh, list questions. And um, what I'll just say, and the only thing I want to point out is that uh, on these sort of community leaderboards for how we're doing against these benchmarks, uh, well, by and large, you know, these are, are approaching sort of solved issues um, with uh, LLMs. Um, another common one is this MedQA benchmark where we have sort of almost like a, a, a case report and then a multiple choice question on, you know, okay, which of the following is the correct next action? Uh, you know, what's the effect of a drug for uh, this patient's symptoms? Things like that, where there's, again, it's a multiple choice, there's a objective answer, and you're comparing against that on whether the LLM got the answer right or wrong. And again, you'll see that, um, you know, through recent advances in these LLMs, right, um, we're doing pretty well on these benchmarks. Uh, the last one I'll point to is this gene touring benchmark where 
uh, you know, there's, there's sort of four categories of these relating to nomenclature or genomic location, functional analysis, sequence alignment. Um, the thing I want to, oh, and, and just to say that again, from the, the, the gene GPT work, right, again, we're getting really close to where, you know, we're, we're losing our ability to, to differentiate um, uh, sort of the power of these methods. Um, so, so my conclusion from, from all of this is, is, is one that to, to some extent our benchmarks are getting too easy, right? That we, we need more and more challenging uh, benchmarks. And, and the second one, and, and perhaps what I, what I think is even more important is that um, they're not focused on providing the explanatory reasoning, right? You know, these are all uh, assessing whether the LLM got the answer right. But as we know, when we think about our role in sort of the, the research ecosystem, when we make computational predictions, the next step is often convincing someone else or ourselves that we want to invest additional time and resources into doing the next experiment. And so um, I think the, uh, the ability for LLMs to produce um, explanations that can motivate those next experiments, I think is, is really important. And so this is where we've been doing a little bit of work uh, thinking about these idea of, of a multi-hop explanatory benchmark through this resource drug MECDB that we created. So, so very quickly, you know, drug MECDB is a manually curated database of drug mechanisms of action. And they're expressed as these uh, reasoning chains through knowledge graphs. So, so there are many, for example, databases that will tell you oh, uh, Fomepazole treats methanol poisoning. Like there's databases of drug indications. But what we didn't find is a, a, that expressed as a mechanism of action where you know that, okay, great, fomepazole uh, inhibits this particular enzyme, this enzyme is part of this pathway, this pathway results in this intermediate, which causes the disease, right? And this is the type of reasoning path that I think uh, is, can be motivating and um, useful for experimentalists to decide again when to, um, when to devote resources to following up on a, a given prediction. So I think benchmarking on this type of resource uh, can be both more challenging and also potentially more relevant in terms of thinking about how uh, LLMs uh, get used in, in our biomedical ecosystem. So right now we're exploring um, you know, how LLMs do in, in reproducing this. Uh, our basic strategy has involved in uh, essentially focusing around chain of thought type reasoning where we're having separate prompts to, uh, or we're doing RAG uh, to get information from other resources, we have separate prompts thinking about entity recognition versus entity linking, and then finally pass construction. Um, and so this is, is ongoing work. So uh, a week ago, I, I was really uh, deciding uh, how to wrap up this talk. Um, and option one would have been uh, to dive in to more what I was just talking about, right? In terms of how we're thinking about that multi-step um, chain of thought prompting for, for drug MECDB. And, um, um, but aside from the general strategies that I've described, right? Uh, I wasn't convinced that, you know, details into our specific prompting strategy was gonna be relevant for us in six months, right? This is a field that is changing uh, so fast. And, and so I decided to take a second route here. Uh, and that is to, to zoom out a little bit. Um, so, so again, the last 20 or so months uh, since the inter introduction of ChatGPT has been, uh, has to me felt pretty chaotic. Uh, I, I tried to come up with a metaphor for sort of uh, my thought process here, and it's not perfect, but, but here's what I've got. Um, for, for many years or, or perhaps even decades, right? Uh, I feel like we've been incubating this nest of eggs. And um, th this is sort of all the work um, that has been done in NLP up to this point, right? In terms of rule-based systems and word embeddings and, and neural networks and deep learning and, and super interesting uh, uh, work with still many good applications. Um, and, and, th and then these eggs hatch, right? <laughs> and, and these I view as sort of the, the, the early LLMs based on, on transformer models. And, and again, for those of us outside the NLP community, I look and I see, ooh, you know, dinosaurs, they're cute, they do little tricks. And you say, okay, great, fantastic. And then, you know, go back to doing what I was doing uh, uh, otherwise. Um, but then, um, you know, came uh, GPT 3.5 and, and ChatGPT. And, and I feel like now um, suddenly it's like, whoa, 
okay, we have um, these powerful beasts in front of us, and um, there are all sorts of applications where people are harnessing these great tools, and um, I don't always know where they're running, but they're running really fast, and I feel like I got to grab one of these dinosaurs, and so I'm, I'm grabbing onto the tail, and you know, he's trying to buck me off, and um, and and you know, again, you can clearly see the potential, um, and but in the process of trying to wrangle these uh, these incredibly powerful tools, I feel like I at least hadn't had the opportunity to step back and really think about what the future looks like and what how do we um, you know have a you know what, what yeah what does the future with these LLMs um, look like? Um, thankfully, um, I think we all know it's going to turn out just fine. <laughs> Problem. Um, but, but but this future thinking, I think, really has been motivated a lot by uh, this book uh, that I, I, I recently read. Uh, it's by, by Dr. Jane McGonigal. So um, Dr. McGonigal is a, is a game designer, wrote a fantastic book called Reality is Broken, all about how game principles can be applied to real life. Uh, fantastic book. But this book um, is about her role as a future forecaster, Okay, which sounds a little bit... Um, interesting, but, but being a future forecaster is not just about having sort of a better crystal ball than the rest of us, right? It's about seeing sort of emerging trends and describing sort of the range of possible futures, um, and then thinking about uh, that future so we can be more prepared for a variety of different scenarios, and also be more creative and innovative today. And so one of the tools she describes of a future forecaster is this concept of episodic future thinking. And that's what we're going to try to do as an interactive exercise today. So what is episodic future thinking? Uh, again, the QR code, if you haven't had a chance to scan it, please scan it. This is the interactive portion of the talk. Um, so, so I'm going to describe a hypothetical scenario 10 years from now. And then um, I just want to ask a series of questions that really explore how you uh, feel about that scenario. Um, and hopefully we'll all learn something in the process. Uh, there's just a few guidelines. So first is um, you have to suspend disbelief, okay? So um, it, it's not a statement of what will happen or perhaps even what is likely to happen. So you just have to accept the scenario as stated and focus on how you would feel and react in response to that scenario. Um, uh, second, uh, whether you love the scenario or you hate it, it doesn't matter, right? Again, uh, there's a tendency is like, ah, this is a terrible future for us. I don't want it, and so I'm not going to play it. But no, no, there's still value, even if you hate it, of still uh, uh, of engaging. Uh, so again, accept the scenario and then focus on your reactions. Um, and the last guideline is, is really trying to make it personal, right? So um, imagine yourself 10 years from now, right? You'll have essentially the same values, same strengths, same weaknesses, uh, but you know, you're in a different life stage. Um, you know, imagine you might be living in a different city, your family and friend groups might be different. So just put yourself in that mindset, you know, do the math, add 10 from your current age, think about that for a moment. Okay, so this is the, um, the scenario uh, or the, the guidelines behind episodic future um, thinking. Okay, so what is the, the episodic, um, future thinking. Uh, today is uh, July 16th, 2034, okay? And uh, OpenAI has just announced the release of GPT-15. Uh, despite the, the, the continual um, development of, of, of uh, other options and LLMs, uh, OpenAI in this future scenario has, has maintained its dominance um, through partnerships with essentially every possible publisher and content provider you can imagine that GPT-15 has been trained on the majority of digital content, text, images, audio, video. Um, through integration with external reasoning type agents, right? Multi-step reasoning, or at least the semblance of multi-step reasoning uh, is now possible. Um, and, and, and again, for the most part, we see the elimination of, of hallucinations, massive context size to look at you know, very large inputs and outputs. Okay, so that's that's the uh, the future scenario we're gonna we're gonna play around with. Again, I want to emphasize the the suspend disbelief um, sort of scenario or, or or guideline, 
And, and, and I want you to, again, put yourself in the scenario, right? Imagine where you are. Imagine how you might have heard about this particular news, uh, you know, who, who, who you might have been with, who you would talk to about this first. Um, give you a moment to, to soak that in. Um, so so I, I want to get a sense for, um, let's see, how am I going to do this? Give me a second here. There we go. OK, now we open up this. I want you, um, so, so now on your, your phone or your laptop, you should see this prompt. Describe your emotional reaction to this uh, GPT-15 scenario. Um, enter as many responses as you like, um, two or three. We'll give it a second. I'm going to hide these so we're not overly biasing each other. OK. 60 responses. OK. Fantastic. OK, so, so let me, um, as, as it continually updates, as more people uh, enter responses, all right, we see in the, uh, a lot of excited and curious and intrigued and happy, right? So a lot of positive stuff going on here. And I also see some fear, yikes. Uh, scary, um, uh, some apprehensive, right? So there's, uh, there's, there's a whole spectrum of emotions, right? This is by no means like a, um, a uniform response. And I bet, right, many of you put in comments on both sides of that spectrum. Um, so, um, and, and that roughly mirrors, you know, how people feel about AI today. Right, and so this is a survey about um, uh, Americans. So this one happens to be uh, restricted to uh, to the U.S. Uh, uh, increased use of AI in daily life, and um, so two things to note. So first, the majority of people are more excited, are more concerned than excited. Right, substantial amount of people more excited than concerned, uh, but but you know there's a lot of people who are in this camp, and it's growing. Right, it's growing over recent years. So um, uh, that's, again, I think, reflected in, in the responses in this room as well, even for this sort of future thinking scenario. OK. Um, oh, I'll mention that the survey is from this Artificial Intelligence Index. Uh, it's a, it's a, a yearly report that tracks sort of all sorts of trends in AI. Um, I'm going to cite it from it uh, a couple different times. Um, so let's see. OK. So. Um, uh, next prompt here, let's see. Um, so within the life sciences, so again, I want to adapt this really to the life sciences and research community. In what area do you think um, the killer app for GPT-15 is, right? What would you do with it? What would be your first sort of class of queries? I don't want to bias it too much, but I'm, I'm looking for phrases like, you know, drug discovery, personalized medicine, things like that. Okay, That's, uh, Okay. so I, I clearly um, see that, but um, great. In addition to sort of um, the prompts I, I suggested there, right, diagnostics, uh, education, um, functional annotation, homework, nice. Uh, <clears throat> so great. Um, so lots of different areas that um, I, I think um, are, are super interesting to explore. You know, in talking over the last couple of weeks with, with, with other folks, I, I just want to sort of highlight two things that, um, two areas that, that I've heard uh, mentioned multiple times, right? And one is, again, this idea of, of clinical support, right? How do th these incredibly, how does GPT-15 sort of impact our ability to deliver medicine, right? And, and, and I was, I would, I'll just say that the, the, the beginnings of that path are, are happening immediately right now. So I'll just highlight one example in this space. This is uh, from Nigam Shah's um, work at, at Stanford, where they're looking at LLM's ability to, um, to operate on clinician-generated instructions. So the instructions are things like summarize this recent annual physical, um, uh, summarize the asthma care plan for this patient, 
uh, identify risk, things like that. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the LLMs currently don't do great, right? So, so GPT-4 in their particular system uh, is 65% right, which means 35% of the time they're wrong, right? And so, so obviously there's, there's some uh, plenty of room for improvement, but uh, it seems likely that, um, you know, with benchmarks like this, the, um, the improvements will be um, there uh, sooner than we think. Another area where we might imagine, you know, huge disruption is in the area of, you know, sort of robot, robot scientists, right? So again, in the news, uh, there's all, already ideas, or this has been over the past couple decades in terms of robot scientists doing experiments semi-autonomously. And there's an example recently here about uh, discovering uh, laser compounds. Um, but in addition, I'll just say that, right, in the same way that we can teach LLMs to query external APIs in the tool augmentation sense, right, so much of science that we do now, right, can be outsourced, right, through contract organizations. So it's not crazy, right, to think that an LLM should be able to order the synthesis of a chemical compound and have that chemical compound shipped to uh, a CRO to do in vitro testing and the subset of those go to creation and testing in a mouse model, things like that. Um, certainly within the, the realm of possibility. Okay, um, what are your biggest concerns uh, in this scenario? Uh, specifically the life sciences, but if you'd like more generally as well. Okay, Let's see where we're at. A couple of great ones in the um, in the comments as well in terms of uh, nefarious uses. So uh, misinformation, uh, privacy, uh, lack of creativity, great one. Um, concentration of power, uh, ethics more broadly, right? Lots of concerns and lots of really um, well-founded <laughs> concerns, right? And and reflecting the uh, greater than 50% of people who have, have uh, concerns about um, AI technologies more broadly. Um, oops, no, 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 I didn't want to do a forward on that one. Sorry, okay. Well, sorry if uh, you were entering data while I jumped around. Okay, so um, l let me just tell you a little bit more what, what, what comes out of uh, these surveys um, from AI. Like, what are actually the concerns, right? And, and they surveyed, uh, I want to say, like 25 or 30 different countries. I've pulled out results for the global aggregated results as well as Canada and the U.S., but they're all qualitatively the same. And so you can see that there are a number of different um, uh, concerns that, are, that, that come up uh, over and over again, many of which we've seen in terms of uh, bias and discrimination, uh, ethical implications, impact on education, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I'm just going to highlight two of them uh, that I felt like highlighting. <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I think uh, just in terms of the camp of the general uh, concerns, right? I think we can't avoid the climate impacts of LLMs, right? I think the the amount of energy needed to train uh, the models has been well documented, and also, right, when you talk about inferencing, inferencing in theory is a much cheaper operation, but when you multiply that by uh, uh, the anticipated usage, I think you, you see quite uh, substantial uh, potential impacts. And so uh, this is roughly today, and what this report from Goldman Sachs shows is that, you know, data center demand, right, for, you know, for many years of essentially flat usage and um, high uh, gains in, in uh, energy efficiency. So anything above the baseline is gains in energy efficiency, right? We are simultaneously hitting this double whammy of increased future data demand. And, you know, we've, we've hit all the low lying fruit in terms of efficiency gain. Nah, we, we can argue about that. Um, but, but again, AI, the, the demands associated with AI uh, only add to that. Um, 
I, I think, it, you know, we obviously can't ignore the malicious uses of LLMs and, and generative AI technologies, right? So there's been many examples where uh, these tools already have been used for uh, phishing and perpetuating misinformation and uh, perpetuating scams and fraud and malware. Uh, within the uh, scientific community, right? This idea of scientific fraud is also, uh, you know, top of people, people's minds, right? Um, and that, you know, these perverse incentives that we have in our academic systems now, right, are incentive for fraud or, 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 or gaming the system. Um, you know, think about things like uh, writing papers and manipulating figures and things like that. Um, but but I do also think there's a more subtle use of LLMs that, that we should keep an eye on, right? Um, you know, suppose in this future scenario, you know, we have busy professors who are asked to review papers or grants, right? I could totally imagine it being a very tempting proposition to throw that into an LLM and ask it to write a first draft. But in that, right, there are all sorts of risks of uh, developing what uh, these authors call a scientific monoculture. Right? When we're always consulting the same oracle on what is good and what is bad, right? we end up with these illusions. Right? We have this illusion of explanatory depth. The LLM has taught us something, so I, now I know all of this field. When in fact, right, that's, that, that's not necessarily true. This illusion of exploratory breadth. I've considered right, all these different options. Well, no, not necessarily. Right? Uh, LLMs aren't, aren't um, designed for that. Uh, and then also this illusion of objectivity where, oh, if the LLM said it, then somehow this has been weighed accurately against all the options that have been here, right? I think these are all, uh, uh, you know, I think intuitively we understand it's not there, but whether those risks are appreciated by uh, all the people and whether, you know, it's one of these things we would just sort of uh, slowly relax into, I think these are, are, are real risks. Okay. Um, one of those cons, right, was all about uh, uh, job displacement. So I, so I am curious, how likely is it that you think your current job would be substantially different or eliminated by GPT-15? That's a quick one. Let's see where we're at. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, great. So, so, so I think this is, um, um, you know, I think definitely people are, are feeling like um, substantially different is almost a, a no-brainer. Uh, eliminated, uh, right? 3.6 out of 10, right? Um, let's, um, so, so again, going back to the AI index, right? Um, probably uh, mirrors this uh, pretty closely, right? 57% of people think that their job will substantially change in the next five years. Um, um, much fewer think AI re will replace their jobs. But 36% is not a small number, right? Um, and uh, that is, is obviously a, uh, uh, a substantial concern. Um, uh, apparently, you know, again, 3.6, that's roughly, uh, is that roughly where we were at over here? Uh, whoa, I don't know what happened there. Oh, okay, great, 3.7, right? So, you know, potentially uh, um, not so different. Um, and so I think that is also a future that, that we need to think uh, carefully about. Okay, the last uh, prompt I'm gonna uh, draw us through and then wrap up. Um, what else can be added to the scenario to maximize benefits and minimize risk? Um, oops, no, we'll go back. There we go. Okay, I think we've seen uh, some, some keep, keep adding them if you're writing it out, but education, 
regulation, legislation uh, seem to be the dominant ones. Um, open models uh, are in there, transparency. Um, so, so I was uh, a, a very interested to read about this, this EU's AI Act that was recently adopted um, that essentially defines what high-risk AI looks like and the guidelines and regulations around how high-risk AI will be developed and deployed and updated. And so I think, you know, based on this broader trend within science, right, I mean, I think it's, it's clear that legislation and regulation uh, is probably part of uh, the future. Um, but I also think that uh, within the scientific research domain, we, we also have the opportunity and, and arguably the, the obligation, right, to create that culture of responsible use of AI technologies. And, and I'll point to uh, an example that I think actually did this pretty well, right? Um, the development of the FAIR principles, right? That was something that the community took on uh, itself and is a great example of articulating norms that we in the community wanted to see for ourselves. The CARE amendment to those FAIR principles, I think was also a great example because it made them even better by incorporating the perspective of, of, of people who are often marginalized within, uh, within this community. And so I think there's, um, you know, we can learn from, from this type of example in terms of uh, how to, to set this stage for, for what we want to see in terms of uh, AI and biomedicine. So uh, really quickly, um, so that, that was the episodic future thinking. Um, love it, hate it. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear what people have to say. But right in terms of, of, of the point of this, right, uh, I started reading that book because it was all about enhancing creativity and innovation, right? By forcing you into these scenarios, force you to consider things you may not have considered before. And I think that's valuable. Um, but in addition, right, I think it is really useful in terms of clarifying goals and motivations, right? This is where you can actually consider, did you like that future or did you not? What aspects of it did you like? What aspects did you not? Um, you know, this is stepping back from, from wrestling the dinosaur into thinking about you know, where the dinosaur is going and how are we gonna uh, use them productively. Uh, as part of that, right, once you decide where you want you know, th this future to look like, right, how do we actually make a game plan between here and there? Uh, increasing emotional preparedness, right? If any part of that scenario is true, right, then perhaps we'll feel more prepared and less surprised uh, when that aspect happens. Uh, and finally, uh, I, I think this is exercises a lot, especially doing it here at a conference is about building communication and collaboration. Um, you know, people in this room, people at this conference, people joining online, right? We, we really have here, you know, current and future leaders of how to apply tech to life sciences. And, and it's not to say that we all need to agree because we clearly won't agree, but at least having this dialogue and uh, the sort of, um, sharing of scenarios, I think is, is important. Okay, um, episodic future thinking is typically done over the course of days or even weeks, not one talk. And it's also usually not limited to one snippet replies. So if anybody wants to continue this discussion, um, we created a Slack channel on the BOSC Slack and uh, you're welcome to share uh, your thoughts um, in more detail. Um, and, and hear what other people are thinking. If people want to do it on social media, I, I've mostly been a social media hermit recently, but I, I might come out of retirement uh, if anybody wants to tag me on any of the social medias. Um, again, what excites you about this scenario? And also, you know, keep it in your routine over the next week or so. Let, you know, because the, what you encounter during your daily routine is sort of a lens through which you consider the scenario. So I just posted in Slack another one, right? If a company offered to buy your personal data, if OpenAI offered to buy your personal data, would you sell it, right? 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 10,000 bucks? I mean, what, 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 what's the price? Or is it, or is it um, not for sale? Other sort of prompts that we can consider over the, the course of the next week. I'll, I'll put these over the next couple of days. Uh, last thing is just to, to thank all the people uh, in, in, uh, who have been um, uh, useful, uh, who, who've been uh, a part of sort of my lab. I uh, have a very close collaboration with Chun-Li Wu, um, another faculty member at Scripps. Um, uh, we have many collaborative projects. And so 
um, grateful to him and his lab. The people bolded here are people who have done the most work in terms of LLM specifically. Uh, funding from NIH uh, and NSF, some very useful discussions around this uh, space from the people down here. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, hey, Andrew, thanks for the uh, very thought-provoking talk, very interesting. So uh, I just want to expand a little bit on the, the sort of strangeness it would be to have chat GPT-15 be something that you know, a commercially owned entity is under one shop. Like we all depend on Google searches, but having it part of like a foundational resource <laughs> of all, all everything we use for our research, like we're all paying them. We rely on it. It's like if, you know if the problems with it are something that would affect all of science, and I guess I just want to see, hear your thoughts about like, you know, I, like one scenario is like, what if governments had their own ChatGPT? But that would probably be worse. You know, we could foresee a future where it'd be illegal to get the correct answer about Obama's birth date, for example. So yeah, what, what, I, I I I think those are are, are great uh, questions, and I, I admit, I mean, um, the current sort of state of um, sort of dominance of open AI in the field does concern me a little bit, right? Um, and even now, just, you know, just now our reliance on that um, because, um, yeah, it concerns me. I don't have the right answer, but I do uh, worry about that sort of inequality in terms of um, centralizing the resources we look at. I, I worry about that growing in the future. So I think you're spot on. Yeah, Robert? Thank you. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, you know, we, there's so much, so much has changed with large language models, and but and also we're seeing so much hype. Um, I'm I, I'm personally a little concerned. I thought you you've done excellently highlighted promises and also limitations. I've got a question for you though. If, uh, we often hear a lot about uh, large language models doing reasoning, right? But we and, and clearly there's so much usefulness that they can be put to. But then we also sometimes see that they fail at simple things like noticing negation or uh, you know, a logic in, a, in an AI sense. Just the, the logic puzzles I loved as a kid, they, they understand the task, they cannot do it. Yeah. And, and I'm just wondering if you could comment perhaps, maybe this is too philosophical, but comment on what you think the relationship is there between large language models and reasoning. And, how do we should we be thinking about that, uh, uh, yeah, Robert? I would love to turn that back to you. I mean, I, I would actually trust your 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 judgment there more. But in for the purposes, and, and Larry just gets up, so I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, we'll hear Larry's thoughts. Um, but but um, for the purposes of this, right? I mean, um, you know, my my gut, right? And it's sorry. So it's so hard to forecast ten years in the future, which is why ten years is a good timeline, right? You don't have to think of step A to B to C to D, right? I think we can agree that given integration, uh, you know, tool augmentation, right, and the types of integration with LLMs and, and other tooling, it's it's the seeds of there of, of hooking up to external reasoning agents to me is at least there. Um, um, so, um, but the mechanics of how that happens. And whether that, how likely that is, is that a 80% certainty over the next 10 years or 20% certainty? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to plead, uh, plead the fifth on that one. Thank you. Just, all right. Oh. Step in and say, we'll take these three questions and then we're going to move on to the next session. Thanks. So I wanted to know your individual professionally educated opinion. No accountability over this. You pointed the EU regulation on AI for high risk, whatever, whatever. Who should be the one making the choice of which one is a high risk and which mm -hmm. one isn't? I'm yeah. thinking from the context of the vaccines, regardless of opinions, politically speaking, <sighs> some people trust the doctors, some people don't trust the doctors. Who should be the one making these decisions? The politician, the expert. Yeah. What's your opinion on this? I, 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 if you actually read the details of that uh, EU AI Act, they, I think they did a very thoughtful sort of outlining of how we differentiate high risk from not. So things like um, job when it affects jobs, right? That's high risk, right? Because of high potential for bias. Uh, healthcare um, things that um, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the other details, but I, I, I do think that can be. Uh, you know, not perfectly enumerated, but uh, good guidelines in terms of where the risks are really 
substantial. So about the risk, not about the people making the choices. You, you would focus on the list of the high risk rather than who makes the choice, which one is that? Uh, I think in making the choices of what is defining as high risk, I think the impacts and the potential negative impacts are the primary uh, guidance there, in my opinion. Hi, uh, it's a really great talk. Uh, you uh, So the this idea that uh, integrating LLMs with curated like structured databases is like really, really important. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about using, taking the outputs of the LLM and then using the structured databases to verify uh, what the statements or provide traceability to its statements. Uh, you know, if there's been work on that. Outputs of LLM and, and, and using the external data sources to assess the output of the LLM. As a really simple example, the, you know, they famously uh, hallucinate paper titles and yeah. things. Yeah. And so having a step where it's like, okay, the LLM produced some stuff, let's make sure this, can we formally check that the things that it produced are actually real? I, I think that, that, that that's a great idea. And, and I think that some of the concepts that we've seen, or I, I saw just yesterday or the day before in terms of self-verification, I think are really uh, interesting where essentially you can ask the LLM, wait, did you, you know, this is what I heard from you, you know, that also has, has significant um, potential um, from what I saw. Andrew, that was lovely. And I particularly like the imagination exercise and trying to do that. And, and I appreciate what you said about, you know, keep it up and keep thinking about this. And you obviously have for a while. And also when you said what the value of the imaginative exercises where you said it really helps you think about and crystallize your idea of what our goals ought to be. Where should we be going? What should we be aiming for? So I'd really love to hear what you're thinking over the last weeks or months and your conclusions are about that. Um, uh, that, 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 look, um, you know, I'm, I'm still hanging on to the dinosaur's tail, um, Larry. Um, um, look, I, I, I think that the, the, the excitement really got me, right? But I'll say that there are members of my lab who really educated me on essentially a, a lot of the ethical uh, concerns. And, and when, you, when you look at it, um, I think there are really uh, strong uh, arguments there. So, um, you know, I, I remain, you know, sort of at the, you know, uh, what, seeing both the potential and and the risks. And so um, how to navigate that? Boy, I think that, that we, we could have a whole session on that. Uh, what should we want? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I don't know that there's one answer for that. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. Thank you.